Welcome back to Campus Party 2013. We're here at Galileo. Um, our next speaker of the day is the award-winning Marcus Chan. He's going to be giving us a session on his top 10 bizarre things, sorry, bonkers thing about the solar system. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for Marcus Chan. Hi, it's uh, fantastic to be here. Great to see so many of you. Uh, a year or so ago, I did an app for the iPad called Solar System for iPad. And in the process of doing that, I learned a lot of uh, peculiar things about the solar system. So what I thought I'd do, to, to do today is do a rundown of my top bonkers things about the solar system. But first of all, to get you in the mood, I've actually put together some slides and music. So I hope you enjoy them. If I can get it to work. She packed my bags last night, free flight. Zero hour, 9 a.m. And I'm gonna be high as a kite by then. I miss the earth so much I miss my wife It's lonely out in space On such a timeless flight
finished a bit. Finished a bit suddenly. Never mind. Um. Yeah. Just going to try and get my presentation up. There we are. Um. Yeah. Are we there? Um, can we see? No, I can't actually see the first of my slides. Um, someone's coming to help. Anyway, I, a, a couple of years ago I did this uh, iPad app. Right, basically this is the uh, opening page of it. It's kind of like a, a chocolate box of planets and moons, asteroids and comets. And by clicking on any of these icons, you, you go to stories about these objects. You can kind of zoom in on Jupiter and spin it with your finger, that kind of thing. And the, the app actually led to a book, which is kind of the opposite way that you normally expect. Normally you get a conventional book and it becomes something digital. So this just shows you how fluid is the, the current digital reality. But in the process of, uh, of, of writing this, this uh, app, as I said, I learned lots of interesting things. So I'm going to do my bonkers things about the solar system. Now this is actually, one of the, I think, one of the most amazing images in the history of science. It's actually a picture of the sun taken at night not looking up at the sky, but looking down through 8,000 miles of the Earth's rock to the sun on the other side of the Earth. Not taken with light, but with neutrinos. Now, neutrinos are ghostly subatomic particles that are produced in prodigious numbers by the sunlight generating nuclear reactions at the heart of the sun. And if I were to hold my thumb up, something like 100 billion neutrinos are going through my thumbnail every second. Now, one of the characteristics or central characteristics of neutrinos is that they are fantastically antisocial. They hardly ever interact with matter. They're hardly ever stopped by atoms. So the actual way to detect neutrinos is to put a lot of atoms together. And this image was created by the Super Kamiokande neutrino detector, which is in deep in the Japanese Alps. And really what it is, it's like, if you can imagine, a giant baked bean can, 10-story high baked bean can, filled with water. And the idea is that very occasionally a neutrino interacts with a hydrogen atom, a proton, in a, in a water molecule, is stopped, and the, the subatomic shrapnel that is produced flies out through the water and it creates the light equivalent of a shock wave. It's called Cherenkov light. It's that kind of bluish light. If you've ever seen uh, radioactive waste being held in those cooling ponds at Sellafield, it glows blue. That's Cherenkov light. So the idea is around the inside of this giant uh, baked bean can of water, there are light detectors. This is actually the inside of Super Kamiya Candy. And these little globes are the photomultipliers or light detectors. And they've taken the water out, which is why these guys are in an in a inflatable. Anyway, the thing about neutrinos is because they hardly ever interact, they can fly from the center of the sun to the surface in a straight line, unhindered, in about two seconds. Then after that, it takes them about eight and a half minutes to get to the Earth. So the neutrinos going through my thumb at this moment we're in the center of the sun eight and a half minutes ago. But what I want to do is contrast the neutrinos with the light. 
the sunlight generating nuclear reactions not only generate neutrinos, but they generate light or photons. And light has incredible difficulty getting through matter. I mean, we can't see through brick walls, and the sun is like a million kilometers brick wall. So, in contrast to the neutrinos, the photons can never travel more than about a centimeter before they're deflected by an atom. So they take the most amazingly contorted route out of the sun. And instead of taking two seconds to get from the core to the surface, as the neutrinos do, photons take about 30,000 years. So my first bonkers thing about the solar system is that today's sunlight is about 30,000 years old. It was created at the height of the last ice age. My next bonkers thing about the solar system is that at the north pole of Saturn, there is a hurricane the shape of a hexagon. This hurricane is about twice the size of the Earth. We know it's persistent because it was actually imaged by one of the Voyager space probes more than a quarter of a century ago. This image is a thermal image, a heat image taken by the Cassini space probe, which is currently in orbit around Saturn. It's been in orbit since 2006. Now, wh why has it got a hexagonal hurricane? Well, the answer is that nobody really knows. But a suggestive thing is that if you spin a fluid in a bucket, the fluid bounces off the edges of the bucket and you get what are called standing waves, patterns in the water. And you can get triangular standing waves or square standing waves or even hexagonal ones. So that's very, very suggestive. However, where is the bucket on Saturn? You only get those standing waves in a spinning fluid if, it's actually, if there's a boundary. And there is no boundary. So again, it's a complete mystery. And it turns out that the southern pole of Saturn has a normal hurricane, a circular one. So that's a complete mystery. No one really knows what, that, what, what causes that. My next bonkers thing about the solar system is that there is no photograph of the first man on the moon. NASA spent about $20 billion in 1960s money, which is probably about a trillion dollars in today's money, but they missed out on the PR opportunity of all time because they didn't photograph the first man on the moon. It turns out that uh, Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, photographed the second man, Buzz Aldrin, but Buzz Aldrin never actually photographed Neil Armstrong. All we've ever got of Armstrong is a photograph of him, or is, is a reflection of him in the visor of Aldrin and fuzzy, uh, fuzzy kind of um, uh, television pictures. Now, people often ask me, this is a footprint, I think of Buzz Aldrin, people often ask me, will this footprint last forever? Well, on the moon, of course, there is no weather, there is no wind, there is no rain, um, there aren't any volcanic eruptions, so you might think that this footprint would last forever. But in fact, there is a rain on the moon, and that's the rain of micrometeorites. And these are kind of dust-sized particles which impact the, the lunar surface. They're exactly the same things that come down through the Earth's atmosphere and produce shooting stars, meteors. But of course, there isn't any atmosphere on the moon, so they just slam into the surface. And they shatter the rock of the surface. And what they actually do is they turn over the top 10 centimeters of the lunar soil. It's called lunar gardening. And they do it about once every 10 million years. So really, the answer is that this footprint will last for about 10 million years. So it will probably outlast the human race. Now, my next bonkers thing is that there is actually another hurricane in the solar system, three times the size of the Earth, that has been raging for at least 200 years. And this is the great red spot on Jupiter. And it's so big that it was seen very, very early on after the invention of the telescope. I think within about 100 years of the invention of the telescope, it was actually seen. That's why we know it existed for, it's existed for a few hundred years. Now, early on, people thought that there must be a giant mountain on Jupiter. And what we were seeing is the atmosphere swirling around the mountain. But of course, what we now know is that Jupiter is a gas giant. It's a ball of gas. 
it doesn't really have any surface. As you get lower and lower in its atmosphere, it gets denser and denser, so the gas becomes liquid and eventually becomes solid at the centre, but there is no surface. So what we're seeing here is, is almost certainly parts of the atmosphere rising upwards and, and the, the atmosphere of Jupiter circulating around that rising, that rising atmosphere. And the red comes from phosphorus, which has been dredged from deep inside Jupiter's atmosphere. Now, this isn't actually a bonkers thing about the uh, solar system. It's just an observation. And the observation is that even the greatest scientists get things wrong. This is Galileo. And Galileo was famous for um, realizing that the swing of a pendulum was regular and that all bodies fall at the same rate under gravity, irrespective of their mass. But arguably a low point in his scientific career came when he turned his newly built newfangled telescope on Saturn, I think it was about 1609, and he declared that it was a planet with ears. Now, the next year, Galileo looked at Saturn with his telescope and he decided it didn't have ears, but that it had a giant moon on either side. But the following year, when he looked at Saturn, the giant moons had vanished. And so he died completely baffled. He never penetrated the mystery of Saturn. That took about another 50 years after Galileo looked at uh, Saturn when a Dutch astronomer called uh, Christian Huygens built a bigger telescope and he was actually able to, to see what Saturn's mystery really was. And of course Saturn is actually girdled by a system of rings. Those rings are, are ice particles which range in size from uh, a dust grain up to maybe a, 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 an office block. And, and if they were around the Earth, those uh, rings, they would extend about a third of the way to the Moon. And they're incredibly thin. If you could actually shrink Saturn's rings so they were about a kilometre across, they would be thinner than a razor blade. They're only about maybe 10, 20, 30 metres thick. And there is one other thing that you should know about Saturn's rings. They aren't rings. They're spirals. They're actually very, very tight spirals, and they're generated by exactly the same mechanism that creates the spiral arms of uh, galaxies like our Milky Way. Now, as Saturn goes around the Sun in about 29 years, we see its rings presented to us at different angles. And when they're presented edge-on, they completely vanish. And when they're slightly oblique, it does look indeed as if Saturn has got ears. So maybe, you know, Galileo, we can't really blame Galileo. My well, next bonkers thing about the solar system is that the body in the solar system that generates the most heat, pound for pound, is not the sun. It's actually this moon, Io which is a giant moon, giant volcanic moon of Jupiter. And Io is hot for exactly the same reason that a squash ball would be hot if you squeezed it repeatedly in your hand. It's being squeezed and stretched by the gravity of Jupiter, which is about 300 times more massive than the Earth. And that's making it very, very hot inside. It doesn't actually have volcanoes. It actually has geysers because nothing come, there isn't anything that's uh, erupting that's liquid. What we're seeing is, is uh, a solid going straight into a gas. So it's like a geyser, like, uh, like um, the ones in Yellowstone Park. My next bonkers thing is that there is a mountain range in the solar system twice the height of Everest that was built in an afternoon. And it's, here it is, it's on this moon of Saturn called Iapetus. And you can see it running, it actually runs about a third of the way around um, Iapetus. And it's, as I say, twice the height of Everest. Uh, Iapetus was the moon that featured 
in 2001, A Space Odyssey, the novel. It was the site of the Stargate, the portal through which the hero, Dave Bowman, goes to another part of the universe. There is a good reason why Arthur C. Clarke chose Iapetus for the Stargate. And that is, in addition to having this mountain range, which he did not know about, Iapetus is unusual in that it's ten times brighter on one face than on the other. It's actually black on one face and white on the other face. And so it looks artificial. So Arthur C. Clarke thought, what better place to face to, to, what better place to put an artificial extraterrestrial artifact than a moon that actually looks like an artificial moon. So, what is the origin of... Well, 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 why is this moon... Why does this moon have this mountain range running around it, twice the height of Everest? It turns out it may well be connected to the fact that it's actually white on one face and black on another face. If you see here the mountain range runs it down the center of the black face. The black face is actually facing towards the ceiling, but the mountain range completely bisects the black face. And what astronomers think is that once upon a time in the distant past, Iapetus, which is a, an icy moon, wandered too close to Saturn's rings. And it ran into the rings. Now remember, the rings are all these ice particles rushing around Saturn like on, a, on a chunks of ice on a racetrack. So it was as if an apertus hit a strimmer. And in the space of a few hours, while the moon was in contact with the rings, a vast amount of ice was deposited along a line on an apertus, building this mountain range twice the height of Everest. It was an incredibly violent few hours, and a lot of the ice was vaporized. But the, the, the actual p ice particles of Saturn, although they're snowy white, are only 99% water ice. They contain about 1% dust, soot. And that comes from meteorites which rain down on the uh, rings all the time. So what actually happened was in this violence, as this mountain range of ice was deposited, supersonic wings blew outwards from the, the, the mountain range which was being deposited and they took the soot and the dust and they deposited it on one face of Iapetus, which is why you have a mountain range and it, it bisects the black face of uh, the moon. Oh, actually, this is Iapetus again, but you can't actually see it very well. But if you could see it, it looks like a walnut and you can actually see the ridge going around it. My next bonkers thing about the solar system is that the largest ocean in the solar system is not on Earth, it's on this moon, which is Europa, one of the giant moons of Jupiter. Um, Europa, um, well, here, here we're, actually, we're actually seeing fractures in the ice. We can tell from, well, Europa is quite close to Jupiter, not quite as close as Io, and Europa is made of ice. And whereas the, the stretching and squeezing of, of Io creates all those volcanoes in a, in a basically rocky moon, on Europa, which is ice, we think that this actually stretching and squeezing and dissipation of heat makes the interior of Europa liquid. So we think, and also when we look at uh, the way that Europa spins, it doesn't spin like a body that is completely solid. It spins like a body that contains liquid. So we think that belief that a 10 kilometer thick layer of ice, and we're seeing uh, cracks in the ice here, is a 100 kilometer deep ocean. Now, before uh, about maybe 30 years ago, no one would have thought that there's any possibility of life down there, because we did think that um, you need light, you need sunlight for life. But then, these things were discovered on Earth, and they're hydrothermal vents, and they exist on the seafloor maybe kilometers down. And really, really, they, they are um, lots of chemicals like sulfur uh, being outgassed at high temperature um, at these volcanic vents. And the organisms that live and thrive around, around here are bacteria, 
which don't actually use oxygen, don't need sunlight, but they extract their energy from sulfur compounds. And they are the bottom of a food chain. And these are the top of the food chain. And these are giant tube worms, which are about as thick as my, my forearm. And they show that really life can exist in total darkness around these kind of hydrothermal vents. Well, one thing we know about Europa is that Jupiter is stretching and squeezing it, dissipating a lot of heat. It's almost certainly volcanic deep down. So almost certainly there will be these, these kind of hydrothermal vents on the seafloor of this ocean under the ice of Europa. So who knows? At this very moment, there could be this kind of life deep down in the ocean of Europa. My next bonkers thing about the solar system is that if you want to see a Martian, look in a mirror. This is actually um, the surface of Mars, and what you're seeing here are the paths of dust devils. These are tiny little tornadoes which kind of spin across the surface of Mars, and as they do, they remove some of the bright surface dust and they expose some of the dark material beneath. So you, you can actually see these are actually the paths of dust devils. Just like that. I just like that picture. It looks like the, the girl with the dragon tattoo. I also like this picture of Mars. This is actually sunset on Mars. A sunset on an alien world. On Mars, which is about 50% uh, further away from the sun than the Earth, the sun is about two, looks about two-thirds the size in the sky. It also looks white when it's on the horizon. And that's because the atmosphere of Mars is about 1% the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere. When we see the sun on the horizon, we see that sunlight has to come through an awful lot of the Earth's atmosphere to get to us. And that, that, that um, air scatters blue light, which is why we have a blue sky. And so we see the sun predominantly red. The, the red light of the, of the rainbow is, is left. But on Mars, this doesn't happen because the atmosphere is so thin, so the sun looks white. The other thing you need to notice is that um, uh, there, there is that, incredibly, even though Mars is a smaller world than the Earth, it has amazingly high speed winds up to about four or five hundred miles an hour, and they hoist fine dust high into the atmosphere. So what you're seeing here is sunlight scattered by dust high up in the atmosphere. And because of this, sunset on Mars takes many, many hours. Much, it takes much longer than it does on the Earth because of this, this afterglow. So, can we expect life like this on Mars? Well, it's not very likely, but there is a good chance of finding some kind of life on Mars. The, the reason is that Mars is a smaller body than the Earth. That means that after it formed, it cooled much more quickly than the Earth. So the conditions were right for running water, for rivers, for oceans, much earlier than they were on the Earth. And in fact, we see evidence that there was running water in a distant part on Mars everywhere, well, pretty much everywhere we, we look on Mars. And the other thing is we actually do find many meteorites on Earth which have come from Mars. So obviously in the past, an asteroid or something slammed into Mars, the ejector uh, was thrown into space, orbited the sun, and was intercepted by the Earth. So we know that rocks come from Mars to the Earth. So there is a, a, a good chance that life, bacterial life, arose on Mars before it did on the Earth and was transported to Earth inside one of these rocks. So that's why I say, if you want to see a Martian, look in a mirror. This is the planet Uranus, or Uranus, however you want to pronounce it. And my next bonkers thing about the solar system is that Uranus was not its original name. It was discovered by William Herschel. He was a German freelance musician. He came over to Britain in the late 18th century. He settled in Bath with his sister, Caroline. Caroline just incidentally, discovered more comets than any other woman in history except another Caroline, who was Caroline Shoemaker in the, tw in the 20th century. Anyway, uh, Herschel was an organist at a church in Bath, but in his spare time, he built telescopes. And he built them in his garden in, in Bath, and he built some of the biggest telescopes of his day. 
And with one of those telescopes in 1781, he discovered a new planet. A planet which the ancients hadn't known about, the first planet discovered in the age of the telescope. But he didn't call it Uranus. No, William Herschel called it George. Um, the reason he called it George was because George III was the king of England. Herschel was an immigrant. He wanted to uh, ingratiate himself with, with the British king, so he named it George. Not surprisingly, the French vehemently objected to having a planet named after an English king. And this is a rare instance where the Germans were the peacemakers because it's they who came up with the name Uranus. But say Herschel had got his own way, going outwards from the Earth, we'd have Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, George. Maybe that would have been better. My well, next bonkers thing about the solar system is, it, is if, if the sun were made of bananas, it wouldn't make any difference. The thing you need to know is why is the sun hot? The sun is hot for an incredibly simple reason. Because it contains a lot of mass. And it's all that incredible mass crushing down on the core of the sun. Gravity crushes it down. It squeezes the material there. And when you squeeze anything, it gets hot. Um, you know, for the same reason that when you squeeze air in a bicycle pump, it gets hot. And at the temperature, uh, sorry, at the, at the pressure at the centre of the sun, the temperature is about 15 million degrees. At that kind of temperature, matter dissolves into a kind of an anonymous, amorphous state known as a plasma. It doesn't matter what that matter is, it always ends up as a plasma. So the sun is something like a billion, billion, billion tons of mostly hydrogen gas. But if you were to get a billion, billion, billion tons of microwave ovens and stick them in one place, or a billion, billion, billion tons of bananas, you'd end up with something of the same temperature as the sun. But what I've actually told you is why the sun is hot at this instant, because it's got a lot of mass. What I haven't told you is why it stays hot. Because actually the sun is losing heat continually into space, but something is replacing that heat at exactly the rate it's lost. Now in the 19th century, uh, because people lived in an age of steam, they thought that the sun was a giant lump of coal. They thought it was a million kilometer diameter lump of coal, the mother of all lumps of coal. But when they worked out how long could that lump of coal burn and, and pump out the amount of heat that the sun was pumping out, they discovered it was only 5,000 years before it would burn out. Even at that time, people knew that the, the sun and the earth was older. Uh, for instance, there are mountains in, in Madeira, uh, off, off the coast of Africa, which are about 10,000 feet high, and they've got seashells, fossil she seashells on the top. So the obvious uh, explanation for that is that the mountains began beneath the sea and they rose up, and that's why you see seashells on top. But of course, people don't see mountains grow in a human lifetime. So it's obvious that it would have taken tens of million years to do that. And in the 19th century, Darwin came up with the idea that all organisms had evolved from a common, a simple organism in the past. But we don't see organisms change much in a human lifetime. So it was obvious that it would take hundreds of millions of years, if billions of years. So we, nowadays, we know from meteorites, which are actually older than the Earth, the rubble out of which the solar system formed, that um, the Earth is a, well, the Earth and the Sun are about 5,000 million years old. So they're a million times older than they could possibly be if the Sun was a lump of coal. So what that tells you is that what's powering the Sun is an energy source that is pound for, pound for pound a million times more concentrated than coal. There is such an energy source, and that is nuclear energy. And we now know that the sun is fusing, sticking together, the cores or nuclei of the lightest element, hydrogen, to make helium. And the byproduct of this is sunlight. Now it turns out this is just about the most inefficient nuclear process you can possibly imagine. On average, 
it takes two hydrogen nuclei, two protons, 10 billion years to find each other and stick. And it's because it takes so long for that to happen that the sun will take 10 billion years to burn its fuel. And it's because of this hugely inefficient nuclear reaction that we can be here. There's been time for the evolution of complex life. I just want to give you some idea of how unbelievably inefficient the sun is at generating heat. If you were to take your stomach and a chunk of the center of the sun, the same size and shape as your stomach, your stomach actually generates more heat. So you might think to yourself, how come the sun is hot? The sun is hot because there's a lot of it. There's a lot of chunks of the sun the size of your stomach all stacked together. And that's why it's, that's why it's hot. So I just, want to, I just like that picture. But uh, the sun is, um, in the process of generating sunlight, it's turning mass energy into heat energy. And it's actually losing the mass of about a million elephants every second. So that's why I showed you that picture of the elephant. My final bonkers thing about the solar system is that the most amazing image, I think, of the solar system is just one pixel across. It's this image. It was taken by the Voyager 1 space probe. Now, Voy the Voyager space probes were launched in the late 70s. By 1980, they'd finished their, their mission, which was to photograph the clouds of Jupiter and Saturn and the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And by that time, <laughs> the, the Voyager probes were flying out of the solar system towards the stars. Now, for a long time, the... American astronomer Carl Sagan, who was on the mission team and famously did the Cosmos uh, TV series, has been agitating for the cameras to be turned back the way they can. And finally, in February 1990, Sagan got his way. And the cameras were turned around and they took this image. Um, ignore the bands, the colored bands. They're artifacts caused by light bouncing around inside the Voyager camera. But the important thing is the ringed dot. All seven billion of us live on that dot. All human history has been played out on that dot. The whole of life on Earth has been evolved on that dot. It is, of course, the Earth. It's the most distant image ever taken of the Earth from a distance of about 6.1 billion kilometers, which is about 40 times further away from the Sun than the Earth is. And I just want to leave you with one thought, and that is we live in a universe with about 100 billion galaxies like our Milky Way. And in each of those galaxies, there are something like 100 billion stars. And in the last 20 years, we've realized that there are as many planets as there are stars. In fact, probably more planets than there are stars. So there are more planets in the universe than there are sand grains on all the beaches around all the coastlines of the world. Yet in all of that immensity, there is only one place where we know of where there is life. That tiny, fragile blue dot. Thank you. If there's time before questions, I'd just like to show some more slides. But is there time? Yeah. I think I can. Oh, I have to, do I have to escape this? Uh -huh.
throw to Major Tom Ground control to Major Tom Take your protein pills and put your helmet on Ground control to Major Tom Commencing countdown engines on Check ignition and may God's love be with you This is ground control to Major Tom the grave and the papers want to know whose shirts you wear now it's time to leave the capsule if you dare this is major tom to ground control i'm stepping Stars look very different today For here am I sitting in a tin can Far above the world Planet Earth is blue And there's nothing I can do minutes okay we've got 10 minutes for questions anyone got any questions you're all brain boggled <laughs> Hi, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I just want to ask you, do you believe strongly that somewhere is another life, somewhere in the universe? Thanks. Uh, well, I, th I think it's, an it's, it's, it's a virtual certainty, really. Um, you know, 100 billion 
stars in our galaxy. Um, we found that planets are incredibly common, far common than we would have expected. Um, we're now finding planets which are much smaller than the Earth. Um, I think something like more than a thousand planets we've found. Um, it just seems beyond bounds of possibility that we would be the first. Um, so the big problem, of course, is that we will be very, very isolated. Um, you know, the, the, the distances between the stars is, is, is very great. I mean, I think somebody said that if you put three sand grains in a cathedral, that's the kind of separation between those, you know, comparative separation that you get between stars. So um, the biggest puzzle, of course, is why we've never actually detected any extraterrestrial signal. Um, but we've been looking with radio waves. Um, we've looked, you know, it's the technology we use at the moment. Carl Sagan, in his, in his uh, book, The Cosmic Connection, s talked about um, people in New Guinea um, who communicate between their separate valleys with, with drums. And if you ask them, how would a, an advanced civilization communicate? They'd say with a bigger drum. And we similarly think that advanced civilizations might communicate using radio waves, but maybe they don't. You know, maybe they, um, if you look at our radio signals, for instance, they're becoming increasingly chaotic. Uh, the way to transmit a lot, a lot of information is with a signal that doesn't have much pattern in it. So our, our, our cellular radio traffic, for instance, the radio uh, waves, if you look at them, they're more and more like a natural source like the sun. So it might be very difficult to actually detect an advanced extraterrestrial civilization. The signals uh, may not be easy to spot. Hope that helps. There's someone behind you. Right back, uh, when you told us about how, um, how big was the sun, you told us that it was like a billion billion um, bananas or a billion billion kilograms of uh, radio, no, microwave waves. You mean microwaves or, or actually their waves because well, what I'm trying to say simply is that the sun is a billion, billion, billion tons. Okay. That's how much it is. And it is hot simply because of its mass. No, no, I, I just, I think I, I just got it wrong because I thought you were talking about the, the waves, the <laughs> microwaves. <laughs> no, 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 no. So it's simply, you know, if you were to get a billion tons of anything together, yeah. whether it's bananas or microwave ovens or anything, it okay. would be equally hot. It turns out that the sun, um, the, the, it's not... in. But the point is that the sun is hot because of the amount of material in it, not because of the type of material. The type of material has a slight effect because um, depending on what atoms the sun is made of, different atoms dam up heat inside the sun differently. So if the sun was really made of bananas, it would be, it would be, it would be pretty much the same temperature, but it would be slightly different. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. I was being facetious about bananas. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, can you tell us which will be the next developments on space research? The next development in space research? God, that's a difficult one. I don't really know. There is actually uh, um, a rover on Mars at the moment, um, which has been there for about the best part of a year, and it's working its way across a crater to uh, a mountain called Mount Sharp, and Mount Sharp is believed to have been deposited at the bottom of um, a lake or ocean when this crater, billions of years ago, was filled with water. And so it's filled with sediments, layers of, of dust or mud that were, layered, that, that were laid down year after year. So the development, the important development was if it discovered in any of these layers of sediment organic material or evidence of living things, that would be fantastically interesting because at the moment we only have one example of biology and that's on Earth. So it would be fantastically amazing to find evidence uh, of, of something like that on Mars. Yep. Can I? Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I wish to ask uh, about sun. Uh, well, it gives us a lot of energy and uh, 
I wish to ask if uh, like uh, the stream of particles and like uh, those uh, electromagnetic eruptions uh, can also hurt our uh, electric infrastructure. Uh, I don't know if you can measure uh, the possibility of uh, some huge blackout uh, here on yeah. Earth. Well, we are very incredibly vulnerable to solar flares and things called coronal mass ejections when a lot of material is actually ejected by the sun. There was a storm in about 1853 um, which was incredibly powerful. Um, it was so powerful that people, telegraph operators, were electrocuted. So when, when, uh, when uh, stuff from the sun comes towards the, sun, towards the earth and it carries with it its magnetic field, if the magnetic field changes over a large conductor, that's a long wire, you get a, a, a current generated. This is how we generate electricity ourselves. So if something like that should happen today with our connected world, we would definitely lose a lot of our power system. This happened in Quebec about 20, 30 years ago and they lost their power grid. But the main problem is that our electronic components are getting smaller and smaller. And so they're much more vulnerable than they ever were before. So this is a real problem. One thing I should tell you about the sun is we don't really receive any energy from the sun because if we did, the Earth would get hotter and hotter. The, the, the Earth actually radiates into space exactly the amount of heat it receives from the sun. If you didn't radiate exactly what you were actually absorbing, you'd get hotter and hotter until you melted. So what the sun... So we actually don't gain energy from the sun. There is, the, the world does not have an energy crisis. It has what's called an entropy crisis. The, we, we degrade the sunlight in using it and it's radiated back into space in a much less usable form. But incredibly, we don't actually gain any net energy from the sun. A little bit at the moment because of global warming, so we are trapping a bit more than we, we give out. But mostly we don't actually do that. Hi. You mentioned that, uh, that Galileo had difficulty in, 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 in seeing the, the phenomena at his time because he didn't have the right telescope. Now, you mentioned this figure of, of, of the amount of solar systems that we have, and it's just such a mind-bogglingly high figure that I couldn't imagine people making machinery adequate enough to make the calculation rough with, uh, I mean, a hundred million or, or a billion or uh, how, how correct, I mean, what is the basis for that figure? But, well, the basis is, is actual observational experimental data. You know, we've discovered that um, something like at least one in ten nearby stars has, pla has a planetary system. And at least 30% of nearby stars have either a planetary system or they have a disk, a gas, a disk, disk of dust around them, what we call a protoplanetary disk, out of which we think planets formed. So this is an incredibly high number. And, uh, you know, so we've actually seen, we, we've now uh, observed um, indirectly uh, other planetary systems with maybe up to six planets. When I say indirect, We still, we still have difficulty actually seeing a planet directly because the star around which a planet orbits is so bright compared to a planet. But we can see things like when a, when a planet transits or goes across the face of a star and it dims it, and we can also see the gravitational effects of a, of a planet, which actually pull... I mean, the Earth actually pulls on the Sun. Uh, the Sun pulls on the Earth, but the Earth pulls on the Sun. The Sun is much more massive than the Earth, so our effect on the Sun is very small. But if you had a, uh, an accurate enough, uh, uh, observed the sun accurately enough, you could actually see the slight movement of the sun caused by the Earth orbiting. So this is how we detect planets indirectly. So we have really, really good evidence that they exist. I mean, this is not just a, a number picked out. If, if you, 25 years ago, it would have been a number which would, would have been complete science fiction. But now we, we, can really, we really know that these planetary systems are very common. Can we get a round of applause for Marcus Chan, please? Oh, thank you. That's the end of our morning session. Uh, we are back here at two o'clock on Galileo with Stuart Hall, Stuart Clark, sorry. He'll be giving us a talk on the universe. So if you are very interested in the universe and how we can understand the universe, please return at two o'clock to Galileo. Right now at 12 o'clock, there'll be a keynote speaker in the main stage and then lunch at one o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs>